Hello, this is Steven. And this is Megan. And this is the Synchrony Podcast, where we talk about transforming apostolic dating culture and ending loneliness in the church. And I'm real tired. Y'all, this episode is going to come out a day or so late because of our children. And it wasn't their fault either. We it just, was 100% their fault. Steven. <laughs> <laughs> they had a hard night. We had a hard night. Two back-to-back hard nights. Yeah, you know, parenting is not linear. <laughs> you go through big highs and big lows, and uh, tonight was low. I don't want to gross anybody out, so I'm not going to go into detail, but there was vomit involved, and we made it here. <laughs> One way or the other, we made it. Yeah, so it's like 11 p.m., and we we're supposed to have this episode done. 11 p.m. Sunday night. We right. usually have it prepped, ready to go, and ready to be launched like like 4 o'clock on Sunday. Yeah. So normally we record like on Saturday and we do all the editing Sunday afternoon after our morning church service. And then we, we have it ready. Um, so that's not going to happen today. So we'll see when we are able to get this out to you guys. But that's okay. Yep. It, it's... It's a rough schedule we want to maintain, so. Yeah. So this is going to be a short and sweet episode, hopefully. Yeah. Before we get into the episode, is there anything that we need to talk about? Uh, No, we're just fully launched now. We're ready to go. We okay. have people that are still in transition between Legacy and um, the main people. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to rephrase all that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so folks that participated in our beta testing before we had the subscription model, before we launched the Synchrony community, um, we gave them a special opportunity to subscribe. And it's a discounted rate to get into the Synchrony community and be part of that because they were the pioneers that helped with our beta testing. Um, so that's still kind of happening. We still have some of our legacy folks trickling in and uh i don't know if i actually told you this but we're given that till the end of the month basically did i tell you that no nope, that's fine okay yeah so by april 30th we'd like to have all of our legacy folks that want to continue to be matched into the community and the reason for that is the community is a really important place for us to continue to build skills and cohesion and um really help people shape their understanding about what dating is supposed to be like and we're really invested in people being part of that community in order to get matched that's how we're going to be able to track who's still interested and available and also help the people that are in there really do the work needed to get ready for dating so um legacy folks have until the end of april to get in with their discounted legacy rate Yep. and after april 30th if they decide that they want to come back into the community or that they want to subscribe they'll just pay the regular rate so that you know they're still more than welcome it'll just be at the normal price sounds good cool we're also going to be in jacksonville in a few weeks yeah. woo, woo. Woo. so if you are coming to the florida district hyphen conference in jacksonville on may 3rd I believe we'll be there and we're going to do fun stuff and we're excited to see you guys in person hope to see you there yep all right babe what are we talking about? I believe we talked about talking about type one and type two decisions. Type one and type two decisions. And I am going to just give honor to where honor is due. This is a concept that I am totally drawing from my day job. <laughs> um, I work at an amazing company. I just am blessed with really gifted leadership there. Um, and this is a concept that we talk about a lot at work that I think actually translates really well to the dating space. Yeah. So what do we mean by, t actually, before we get into type one and type two decisions, let's go with this. The reason why we think this is a good topic to talk about is because we see folks getting really hung up about dating decisions very early in the process. Yeah. Like, do you want to kind of throw out an example of sort of some of the, the, roadblocks people run into with decision making early on yeah i think what we're seeing happen 
more frequently is people defeating themselves mm. out of talking to someone mm -hmm. before there was ever even a chance to talk to someone. Yeah, like talking themselves out of it or... Yeah, or like saying that there are so many checklists that they think are mandatory mm. that really are just nice to have. Mm -hmm. And they're sometimes losing opportunities to not be able to talk to someone great and just have a good experience of going through this process. And they're kind of bottlenecking themselves. Yeah, I think so. And this isn't to say, you know, that this isn't everyone, right? No, no, no. Not no. every single that we're working with is running into this. So if you're listening to this and you've had a consultation and you're going like, is this me? Like, not necessarily. But no, we just wanted to, we were at dinner tonight and we were talking about this actually. And type one and type two decisions came to my mind. And because we, me and Megan use this in our married life mm -hmm. all the time. And sometimes I'll be fixating on a problem that we have going on in our marriage. And yeah. Megan goes, Stephen, that's a type two decision. Right. Type one and type two decisions are about helping you get unstuck. They're about helping you find velocity and move forward with sort of a sense of freedom in your decision making. Yeah. Because it's human nature to really sometimes get bogged down in, in, in our heads. Yeah. And very cerebral about the decisions we have to make. So what is a type one decision? Okay, so a type one decision is probably something you're only going to make a few times in your life. A type one decision is a decision that if you make the wrong choice, it is extremely difficult and expensive to reverse your choice. And that actually applies to very, very few decisions that we make, right? Um, in business, and not necessarily expensive in money. No, no. It just means that you've poured a ton of resources into the decision. Yeah, it could and, be time. Right. That you're, that you're not going to get back out of it if you make the wrong decision. So you lose whatever investment you've poured into that decision. So an example in the business world would be like, you know, if you if you own a factory and you decide, hey, you know, we make we make plastic cups and we're going to make a pivot. And now we're only going to make recycled paper cups right you really only get to make that decision once to completely change your product line yeah and you had better be sure before you do that that it's the right choice because <laughs> yeah. if you make the wrong decision your factory shuts down your business closes right realistically a human's only going to make a handful of those decisions in their life yeah right so that's type one decisions very very few actual decisions are type one. Every other decision that you make is a type two decision, which means that it is reversible. Without losing too much, you could change your mind later. If you find that you make the wrong decision with a type two decision, typically that is not going to put you in a scenario of undue risk. Yeah. Right. If, you know, in, in the business example I just gave, it would be like, hey, we are a plastic cup making company and we want to start a side project of releasing one line of paper cups just to see how it does. We're going to do this experimental release of just this one product in a few select stores and beta test it. The decision to do that is very low risk. Yeah. Right. Because you only pour a little bit of resources into it and you're just putting it out there to see what happens and sort of run an experiment. Yep. Type two decision. I, I actually realized, um, I figured out a really good example. Yeah. Um, when Megan and I first got married, we were living in West Palm and we had no kids mm -hmm. and we were deciding on whether we wanted to stay in West Palm or not. Mm -hmm. Um, she had already started working for this company remotely and it was a good job and she can move anywhere. And so we're like, okay, w let's consider areas to move. Mm -hmm. But I started getting a little fixated on the idea of moving from West Palm. It was hard for me. Because that was where you grew up. Because that was where I grew up. And I was like, almost panicking for a little while. Not very long, but for a little while. And... After a couple of weeks of us going back and forth, if we wanted to move or not, Megan came to me and said, Stephen, this is a type two decision. Yeah. 
We can always move back. And she goes, let's, we can move somewhere, anywhere we want for a year. We had no kids. It's not like our kids were going to lose their family or, right. yeah, sure, we were moving away from family, but we can move somewhere. We sign a year lease. This is before the rental market went yeah, crazy also. But still, like, yeah. we moved somewhere for a year. Well, yeah, we paid some moving expenses. And if we don't like it, we can come back. And when she boiled it down to that, it was, sure, it was going to be a time investment of us being there for a year. But at the end of the day, it wasn't like the world was going to disappear if if I moved from that town. It was mm-hmm. just us going to be gone for a little while, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the best example for me is that that was the perfect definition in my life for a type two decision. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that type two decisions aren't important decisions. Yeah. Because where you live is important. Absolutely. Right? And it doesn't mean that they're not um, potentially complicated decisions, right? Because yeah. we were having to figure out, okay, really what it boiled down to is, are we going to move to a new place or are we going to move to my hometown? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's is what we we're going back to. Kind of what about. we came down to. We had, and the place we ended up moving was a place that neither of us had ever lived before, which is, I think, where a little bit of the anxiety was coming from. Right. Spoiler alert. One of the best decisions. Yeah, we it was made. the best decision for our marriage. Oh, ever. my goodness. Uh, yeah. Incredible church. Incredible growth opportunities for both of us. But we love you, Fort Myers. Yeah. Fort Myers, the, the Fort Myers Church. They're just, um, I mean, absolutely transformed us. If if you are a young person considering getting married or dating someone who lives far away or who lives in a different place. I guess even someone who lives where you are, if you have the opportunity, I would encourage you once you get married to move away for a little while because yeah. going to a new place with your your spouse and getting to reinvent yourselves together somewhere different is just really powerful. But that's a whole nother episode. But yeah. it's a it's a beautiful experience that we had as a young married couple. Yeah, so great. So basically how you know what, let's talk about how type one and type two decision making relates to dating. We see people very, very frequently, excuse me, get stuck in some of the early decisions that have to be made in the dating process, right? Yeah. And they're decisions like, do I want to have a conversation with this person? Yeah. Right? Or should I tell this person my preferences about A, B, and C, right? Should I make the first move? And I'm not even talking about synchrony dating experiences necessarily by themselves. Like this could also be happening if you're just making dating decisions out at a conference or, you know, in the wild, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. as you love to say. Um, Those are all type two decisions, right? They feel much, much bigger than that because I think of all of the weight that we put on them as people who might be a little bit anxious or nervous about approaching someone in a dating scenario, those decisions can feel very, very charged. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to lead someone on if you don't Mm -hmm. end up being attracted to them. You um, don't want to hurt people's feelings. You don't want to waste your time. So there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, And I don't necessarily blame people for it. No. And actually, let's talk a little bit about what you just said about the not wanting to hurt people or waste their time or, or, you know, damage people's feelings. I've heard a version of this frequently of like, well, this person, you know, like I don't I don't necessarily find them totally physically attractive, but I find them really interesting. But I don't want to take them out on a date or talk to them and then realize that I'm not into them and then have to break that to them and and you know, hurt their feelings. And I appreciate the compassion of that stance. It's like, a little bit of a cop out. Yeah. If, what I want to say first, I don't think that if, if, if those people most of the time were to really dig down, that it's about the other person's feelings yeah. necessarily because they don't know them well enough to know what their feelings would be. Yeah. They haven't invested <laughs> enough time into learning about this person to understand the depth of their emotional landscape. They don't know how this person would react (laughs) to these situations, right? They're guessing. So I think it's a way to say I'm I'm too nervous to put myself out there and I don't want to, you know, build up hope. Or Or I don't want to risk getting hurt. 
Yeah, and that's a totally natural human thing to do. Yeah. But also, just to give people, like, release, in these early dating experiences, you, single person, are not responsible for the other person's feelings. Nope. That does not mean you're going to be unkind. It doesn't mean you're going to be callous. It doesn't mean you're going to be disrespectful. You're not out to hurt anybody. But you are not responsible for how someone responds to your decisions about what's right for you. Yeah. Which means that if I'm a single person approaching you, hypothetical other single person, and I think you're really cool and we start talking, and then I realize there are just some things that aren't aligned with what I want and need. Yeah. That it's okay for me to say, hey, this has been really interesting and I really appreciate your time. I can tell that we're not right for each other. And I don't want to take up any more of your time that you could be using to find someone else. So I think we should stop here, but it's it's been great to get to know you. I should be able to say that without worrying that that's going to send you through some kind of an emotional loop. Yeah. Because that's not my job. I'm not your wife yet. <laughs> exactly. Right? And I'm apparently never going to be at this point in this hypothetical scenario. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not emotionally responsible for you, other adult, <laughs> you know, in this dating space. And I think people have gotten really finicky about that. Like they're really nervous about upsetting people. And frankly, as a woman, I think some of that is because that can be a dangerous situation, right? Yeah. There are lots of examples of women who have said no to men and have suffered a lot of... um critique or abuse or you know basically have have been punished by those men for that rejection i'm sure that's happened and, the other I way mean, that's too. a whole nother red flag of yeah <laughs> huge problem there right? yeah um yeah but that's that's a that's a very clear sign of an unhealthy relationship. Yeah. And and so, I mean, you know, good on good on these women for setting those boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. And shame on anyone who hears someone set a boundary and pitches a tantrum about it as an adult. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I take it back to our breakup, which we were obviously much farther into our emotional sort of communication at that point. But... I broke up with you and you said, I'm so proud of you for doing what you needed. And then you said, I'm going to leave you alone. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the, the level of respect that that demonstrated to me was so huge, you know, like it was hard and heartbreaking, but it was also so deeply respectful of my choices. Yeah. So you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it worked out great in the end. So anyway, I guess the takeaway there is like, if you are, um, if you feel like you need to make a decision that you're not sure how it's going to be received, permit yourself to make the decision based on what you need and what you're hearing from yourself and from the Lord and from your counselors. And if the other person is going to pitch a tantrum about it, you're going to have to be okay with that. Yeah. But let's go on the other side and say they don't pitch a tantrum. Mm -hmm. Now you just had a really positive experience. Yeah, now you, you got to know you got, someone. You got to know someone. You got to be friends with them, get to know a little bit about them. Mm -hmm. You learn that it didn't work out, and that's okay. And you guys could both go your separate ways and try to meet new people. Right. And you're not obligated to, like, stay friends. No, no. So uh, now I'm going to target synchrony-specific people. Yeah. Um, Anyone who's coming to synchrony is looking for a serious relationship. Right. Like this is the culture we're trying to break. We're trying to break like the tender, the sorry, the tender culture of like, uh, and not just specifically tender, but like any of like the casual dating, casual right? dating, getting to know you, wasting your time, kind of conversations, yeah. and you're meeting people who are in the same mental space as you. Mm -hmm. You're not wasting their time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, I mean, if, they want to get to know you as much as you want to get to know them. Yeah. If all that happens is you provide them with the opportunity to practice these really difficult to master skills yeah. of learning about someone and communicating with them and identifying values, then good on you. Like you've served them. Yes, exactly. You know, uh, we want to demystify um, 
the initial approach to dating to dating yeah the bar the bar to start a dating interaction should be low yeah and not weighted down with all of this gravitas and meaning right yeah you walking up to someone and saying hey you seem really cool could we chat sometime should require nothing more than just interest and curiosity. Yeah. It puts unnecessary pressure on the relationship. Yeah. And you don't need guys like, you know, this is maybe very particular to our church culture, but it's like, we've gotten to this point where we're like, Oh, I need to find, I need to see a sign from God in the sky. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, a giant, a giant arrow made of fiery clouds pointing down to the head of this person from across the sanctuary at my district rally to to be sure like i have to be sure before i initiate anything and like you can't be no but it goes back to our first podcast or first or second podcast so i was talking to someone today who so helpfully helped me move my couch today thank mm -hmm. you um and he was saying that when he was listening to the podcast that he what really resonated with him was when i had the conversation with pastor kyle mm about like is it god's will for me to go to this relationship mm -hmm. and he said and sorry for all the people who've already heard this but he basically said it's up to me pastor kyle did yeah pastor kyle said it's up to me to choose someone who i want to be happy with as long as that we are equally yoked and that we put god first in our marriage and we be sensitive to his voice with what we do in our marriage. Right. But who I choose is up to me. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why in the Bible it doesn't tell us how to find a wife yeah. or find a husband. It just says like a little couple parameters. Yeah. Here are the characteristics. Yeah, exactly. Or do your own legwork. Yeah, exactly. So at the end of the day, he says that blew his mind mm -hmm. because we have such a culture of the one. Yeah. And... That's not the way it works. No. And it gets us into trouble. It does. And it gets us stuck with people who are unhealthy and abusive. Yeah. I mean, because I'll, we were like, well, what if this is the one and I'm supposed to be with this person? Right. And we'll go into this in a different episode, but this is part of my testimony that I'm really passionate about. Like before you and I dated, I had a very serious relationship that had all of the signs, right? Like me and my whole family had read into you know, how these different quote unquote coincidences had aligned for me to meet this person. And we could, we could write the hand of God into this whole story. Yeah. And it was wrong. Yeah. Every, you, you wrote the hand of God. Into yeah. The story. I put words yeah. in his mouth the entire time. Yeah. But from a church culture perspective, everything had fallen into place so beautifully. Yeah. And it was a house of cards. I mean, it, and it nearly destroyed me. It nearly took me out spiritually I mean, it took a long time to recover from that. Yeah. Um, so we need to we need to unpack the um, the experience of meeting someone and expressing interest. It's not a mystical thing, usually, and it's not a um, you know it's it's not a magic formula, right? No. And it's not that big of a deal to make a mistake. Yeah. Like the worst that's going to happen is you're going to get a little embarrassed maybe because you accidentally express interest in someone who's not available or who isn't interested in you. Yeah. And that has to be okay. Yeah. If you, if, if that really makes you uncomfortable, I would encourage you to do some emotional work to kind of unpack why and what that, what that type of discomfort means for you more broadly. Yeah. Because that's not just about, a dating interaction, right? Ultimately, a dating interaction, an initial one, is two adults just expressing curiosity about each other. And that that can be it, right? Yeah. And if it's wrong, then you guys can both shake hands and say, hey, well, this was hilarious. You know, nice to meet you. And move on with your lives. Yeah. So I feel like we need to put some um, some more framework around you know, where type two decisions show up in relationships versus type one, right? Yep. Most of the decisions you make in dating in terms of 
who you expressed interest in, how you chose to do that, where you go on your first date, who visits who first, all of those things are type two decisions, right? Who says I love you first, who, you know, starts talking about marriage first, right? All of these things are are type two decisions, choosing to do those things. If it doesn't work out, not that big of a deal. The only type one decision you make in your dating relationships is choosing to marry someone. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You could you could talk about choosing to love someone and fall in love with someone, but frankly, I don't know if that's much of a decision. I mean, it is a decision to love, but like, I think sometimes people don't really do that consciously. It's not like a moment yeah. where suddenly they're like, it's nah. like an involuntary moment. Yeah. Um, maybe if it were more intentional, we would be better at, at a lot of things to do with relationships maybe, but I don't know. I think we chose to love each other after we got back together. I know, but I think we're a little weird. Yeah. That's, that's probably true. Yeah. But I mean, I think, I think it's a good idea to intentionally decide this is a person I want to commit to and love, but really ultimately in a dating relationship, you can back out of anything, right? Yeah. Up to the point where you stand at that altar and say, I do to them. And I've met people, you know, through synchrony and just out in the world who were engaged to people and broke off engagements. Yeah. And they had to eat the cost of that. Sometimes the actual cost of, you know, the money they put out for whatever they had already purchased or the invites they had already sent out. And they had to eat some humble pie. Like that's, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to. Well, and also there might be people in their lives that have might have tried to warn them and they didn't want them to be right. Yeah, or you know, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 there's no there's no getting around the idea that that would be an awkward and difficult situation. So I don't want to make it sound like that wouldn't be a challenge. Right? Oh, absolutely not. But even then, even if you are engaged to someone and about to get married to someone, if you decide then that it's the wrong choice, you can still reverse that without that much cost. Yeah. Right. Once you are married, once you guys own a home together, once you have children together, once you've been you know, sexually intimate in the way you can only be with someone that you've been married to. Yeah. That decision gets much harder to reverse and much more expensive in terms of the emotional pain and the monetary cost, right? Getting out of a marriage that was a wrong choice is very, very hard. Yeah. Um, so... We want to give people the freedom to make lots of type two decisions quickly and openly and with an open mind and an open heart early on in their dating relationships so that they can intentionally make the single type one decision of who they marry with all of the information they need. Yeah. And you're not going to have all the data that you need to have about this other person in terms of who they are and where their values are and what kind of uh, what, what, what their character is like. Unless you let yourself openly make a lot of decisions about getting to know them and doing that freely. Yeah. Without getting stuck in your head about whether or not it's okay for you to be the one to walk up and say hi first. Yeah. yeah. So I just thought about something. Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways, what we do through synchrony, mm-hmm. where we when we do our consultations, we are trying to find the difference between type one and type two, dis- type two decisions for you. Oh, and learning about people's values. Yeah, when we're doing the consultations, because yeah, the type one decisions are I want to have kids. Mm, the yeah. type one decisions are I can or cannot move from where I live. Mm-hmm. The type one decisions are like the big questions, the big things that are important to you. The things that the things in which you are deeply invested. Yes. And that introducing you to someone who's not aligned with you on would create massive risk. Absolutely. Um, Say you don't want someone who has a lot of debt. Right. um, Or consumer debt, I should say. Mm -hmm. Non mortgage debt. And you say you you say you want someone who is more financially responsible. That mm-hmm. those are big decisions, important decisions, that we try to filter through. 
So when we match you with someone, we know that we are hitting as many of those type one decisions Mm -hmm. that you made for yourself. And then saying, hey, here is a person who has a lot of these checked off. Now, the type two decisions might have to be a little flexible. Give this person a try. Yeah. And I think that's the big thing is is we're we're taking the really big and important questions that are barriers for you to be able to marry that person Mm -hmm. and laying it out on the table and saying, hey, this could be a good fit. Yeah. Why don't you try talking to him? Yeah. And what's funny is we keep on we we've run into a couple people who like shut it down before it has had a chance to even meet someone based on type two decisions. Yeah. And I mean, so I want to differentiate between type one, type two decisions and things that we would call like values and preferences. Right? Okay. Yeah, so, I was overly like generalizing it. But. Yeah. I mean, and they they go, they go hand in hand. So I think you're right to kind of put them together. So I would say type one decisions have to do with ensuring that your values are preserved, right? Those are the decisions that if you make them wrong, it will compromise who you want to be as a person. Yeah. It'll compromise what you were called to do in the world. And it might compromise the lives of people very close to you. Like if you have children, Mm -hmm. right? Whereas preferences, decisions related to your dating preferences are type two, right? If it's about whether or not you would date someone who doesn't look quite like what you think they, that you're attracted to, easy to reverse that decision if it doesn't work out, right? Yeah. Um, or easy to bring yourself around to that decision working, you know, if you get to know them and you find that, oh, their personality makes them really attracted to me, right? Yeah. And I want to also be careful that we don't make it sound like, you know, every time we, like, I, I don't ever want someone to hear that if we suggest that they meet someone that we're going to be really disappointed if they say that they don't want to. Right? Oh no, no. Like they have, they have the ability to say, Hey, I don't think this is a good fit. Yeah. And, and you're, you're absolutely right. I just, there's no harm in trying is what I'm saying. Yeah. Like it's an hour of your time right? and you, there's zero commitment to it. If you choose not to move forward with it. Mm-hmm. So sure. Your, your time is valuable, but to me, it's like, why not give it a shot? Yeah, it's not that big of a deal if it doesn't work out. Yeah, you're not considered a heartbreaker if you go through five or six different consul or uh, not consultations, uh, date nights with mm. Megan or I, and it doesn't work out. That's okay. Yeah. Like that's like matchmaking is not meant to happen on the first try. Yeah, it usually well, takes. I mean, wh- what I'm finding is that it takes me about on average like three ish dates for me to really understand exactly what that person needs and hone in on it yeah yeah and you know that's challenging because there might not be the right person in the pipeline for me to have three different people meet someone right but yeah it takes it takes practice to figure out what actually matters in those scenarios and what's a, a not that big of a deal so i think the um Especially like if if you're someone who hasn't dated before, which is a a decent portion of our population in the project, right? If you've never been in a dating relationship, especially if you've, if you're in, you know, a period of what we would call extended singleness, right? Where you're single longer than you anticipated being. Then I understand why some of these initial interactions might feel like burdened with challenge or purpose or complexity lower the bar a little bit yeah allow yourself to get to know someone and decide that you don't want to talk to them anymore if that is what happens right it's okay yeah and it doesn't mean anything about you to meet someone and decide that they're not it like that doesn't mean that you're less of a of a dateable and attractive person yeah to do that do we cover type one and type two pretty well? Um, I think due to our sleep deprivation and stuff like that, I think it might be a little scatterbrained. But <laughs> maybe we. Should. I will admit, we did not have an outline for this one. 
but no. <laughs> I think we got the the major points. So just to recap, yeah, do it. Do a quick uh, summary. Yeah, I'll do uh, the microwave version, the Spark Notes. Um, type one decisions are decisions that are incredibly expensive and difficult to reverse, and you'll probably only make a few of them in your life, including who you marry. Yeah, that is one big important type one decision. All other decisions that you'll make in dating or in life elsewhere are type two decisions, which if you make the wrong one, it might be a little uncomfortable. It might be a little difficult momentarily, but ultimately you are resilient enough to make those decisions poorly and pivot and then make the right decision after that. So when you're in the initial phases of dating in synchrony or elsewhere, give yourself permission to Make those type two decisions quickly and with confidence, knowing that even if you make a mistake, you'll be able to recover. Yeah. And it's going to be okay. Anything else we want to say about that? No, I think you did a good job. Thank you. We made it somehow through all the haze of the day. Yeah. Thank you guys for bearing with us. This is, um, I think this is going to be our 10th episode. Yeah, I was about to say that. It's our, our big 10. <laughs> yeah, woohoo. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah, I'm I'm pumped about it. And I don't sound like it. I'm just, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. Uh, things are starting to come together. So thank you to everyone who's been listening. Um, continue to send us your questions, questions at synchronyproject.com. You can leave them there if you want us to talk about them on the podcast. Um so definitely drop something there if you are curious about anything. Um, the only other thing to know is that if you are already a member of the Synchrony community, we do have our next fun event on the schedule. So yep, May 10th. May 10th. We're going to be getting everybody together. On your birthday. Yes, it does happen to be my birthday. So what a better what what better thing to do on my birthday than to hang out with our whole community? I'm actually pretty excited. Oh, yeah. We're going to get child care and party. Yeah. I'll bring myself a piece of cake. That's you can, right. <laughs> you can have some too. Um, but yeah, we're going to get everyone together for a game night. Um, so if you are, if you've already done your consultation and you're like, what is this community thing? Uh, if you've done a consultation, you have access to be part of the synchrony community. So check your email for information about that or reach out to me if you aren't sure. But yeah, I'm excited about us getting into a rhythm of doing those community events so that people can hang out with each other and get to know each other. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys, for listening. Um, Please share and like and comment if you have any questions or concerns. Yeah. Pray (laughs) for our sleep. And (laughs) thanks for hanging out with us. Hey, babe. Huh? I love you. I love you. Especially on days like today. (laughs) (laughs) It's amazing that we are still happily married couples on days like the last couple of days that we've had. I mean, I come away from these days, like, this is how I know that, that we made a good choice with each other, right? I come away from days like today going, this has been trash, and there's nobody I would rather be doing this with, (laughs) because I can't imagine being with someone else and it being, like, any, like, nobody else would make it as easy to recover as you do. Yeah, and this year we'll be celebrating our eighth anniversary. So if you like me so far for seven years, the it's not like we're good. it's not like we're newlyweds. It's not like we're in the honeymoon phase. Yeah, no, no, the shine's really worn off. <laughs> 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 we've, we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly at this that's point. Right, that's right. And we've done. Hey, we've moved uh, three times, four times. Yeah, something like that. We've had two children, multiple pets. We've buried yeah. some animals. Rest in peace. Yep. So, you know, I think that counts as us seeing quite a bit of the, the married world so far. We <laughs> built up. There's going to be 0.01% of people that are going to actually hear this part of the podcast. So No. <laughs> Someone's still listening. You know thank, who you are. Thank you. The real, the real MVPs. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. We love you. Have a good night. Bye, guys. Bye.